All right. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Kwanzaa. I don't know. I don't care. It's a wonderful holiday season. Here's the giveaway. Here is the wonderful giveaway. The holidays came early for some of you. Here's what you're going to get for free if you leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. And if we have to pick your comment, you have to have the best comment. Sorry, we can't give this to everybody. We are giving, but we're not stupid. So if you leave a great comment and we notify you, here's what you're going to get for free. It's the ultimate at-home holiday workout bundle. Maps Anywhere, Map Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula. All those for free for one of you lucky viewers. Now, everybody else, we didn't leave you out. Here's what you can do. You can actually head over to mapsdecember.com, get all of those programs for the low price of $99.99. Now, normally they retail for $338, which is still a great value, still awesome, great programs. But no, we slashed the price down by 70%. $99.99. Head over to mapsdecember.com. All right, here comes the show. Let's talk about building the ultimate at-home routine and what that would consist of and what you guys would want to put in there if you were to do that. You know what's funny about that is I was just on um, a podcast with Max Lugavere, and uh, he brought something up interesting. He said, with people, with the holidays and people traveling to visit family and you know go different places, he says he's getting a lot of messages from people who are working out at home. And if you think about it, it's probably, aside from you know what just happened recently with gyms getting closed down and stuff, where, where we had a lot of people working out at home, that's probably, aside from work, the time that most people would need a good routine to work out without a gym, right? Well, because they're traveling to the East Coast or the West Coast, or they're going to their mom's house, no gyms around. Right. I want to work out, though. I want to keep my fitness up. Have, yeah. have any of you guys followed up on the the stat that we, we talked about? I don't know, maybe the beginning of or relatively early in the pandemic um, when we talked about how many people were moving away from uh, working out in a gym and actually starting to work out at home. I did not. I have no Just, idea. I'm curious. Remember, because there was a, yeah. a little bit of a debate that we had on. I believe that we would see the, a strong come back to gyms and you speculated that it was going to forever change the market and that we're, we're going to see a lot more at home training. And I think, uh, you know, with the, the surge of tonal and, um, Peloton and a lot of these at home workouts and their stock and what we saw happen, uh, early on in the pandemic was pointing in the direction that you were probably right. I'm curious if mm. it's still, like I that. think it's turning around. I do think there's some statistics that show that people are more comfortable now coming back to the gym, but I don't think it's anywhere close to what it was. So there's a lot of people that are still trying to make it work uh, on the confines of their house. And a lot of people weren't able to actually get a lot of equipment either because there was yeah. like scarcity there. So, um, you know, they're trying to construct ways to work out with minimal equipment. Yeah. So this is the longest ever in my life that I've not used a gym. Never in my life have I gone this long of a period of time and not gone to like a traditional big box gym mm -hmm. and all of my workouts have either been here mm -hmm. or at home. And you haven't gone to a commercial gym. I went to, I think twice and I had to wear a mask and do the whole thing. And it was just so not the same. I, I was mm -hmm. not a fan. I so. think what we're probably going to see, Doug actually brought up an article. I think you're going to see a lot of people go back to gyms, but there's a, per, but the percentage of people that workout at home, I think, is forever more than it than it was before. I mean, it's hard to tell though, right? Because we're still kind of in this like we we we're not back to normal mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. So the and part of why I haven't gone back, you know, Justin, I like, I have no desire to try and wear a mask while I work out. Like yeah. I get irritated walking through the grocery store, yeah, wearing a mask because it just feels uncomfortable and weird. And for that long period of a time of wearing it, like I can't imagine exercising with it. So. It's, I'm so curious to, you know, if things were more normal, you know, would we see this surge back into the gym? Yeah, I think one of the challenges too, unless you're like a, a, some kind of a specific strength athlete, like if you're a power lifter or an Olympic lifter, you're going to need access to specific types of equipment, um, you know, barbells or, ex, you know, weights you could throw and draw, bumper plates, yeah, you know, platforms, platforms and platforms. things. But for the most part, most people who are interested in overall fitness and muscle building and fat loss, there still is this kind of this, this stigma around working out at home that it's like this um, inferior option somehow, mm -hmm. right? Which really isn't true. There's a lot you could do it's not at home. True. It's not true at all. And that's coming from somebody who 
was on the other side. I, mean, I, I believe I was arguing a lot with you that I don't like it. I don't think it's anywhere near as good. But to be honest, I've I've learned to love it the last couple of years, dude. It really has been nice. Um, there's certain aspects that I, I think I miss of of the atmosphere around it, but I think I had that same feeling too. Like, oh my my physique is going to suffer, yeah. or my strength training is going to suffer if I don't have access to all these different tools. And the truth is, it highlights what we talk about all the time. I mean, the, it's the big lifts and movements that are give you the biggest bang for your buck. And I can do all those. I can yeah, squat, I, deadlift, overhead press, bench press. Yeah, and, I haven't worked out in a, a gym consistently for 15 years, at least. You know, I had my yeah. studio where I had minimal equipment. It was just personal training only. And that's it. And ever since then, I've gone to gyms, but not consistently. And I've used to be able to say that your physique shows that, but now you have the best physique in all of us. So I can't, I can't say that anymore. You know what I'm saying? Sal took that to heart. Like, yeah, you did. Every day, I'm going to show Adam. I'm going to show Adam. You don't need this stuff. with one band. Yeah, yeah. You, know? He's a, sure you don't need no, yeah. you don't need no these machines. Well, yeah. here's here's the here's some of the biggest challenges I think that people um, encounter with working at home. I think the biggest one is the lack of equipment and the lack of space, right? So you go into a gym, you have machines, you have lots of dumbbells, lots of barbells, cardio equipment, lots mm -hmm. of variety, lots of space to do your workouts. And then when you're at home, you're like, okay, I, I don't have a, a, and a lot of people don't have a room dedicated to working out. So they're like, okay, I don't have a lot of equipment, don't have a lot of space. What could I possibly do? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot you can do. For example, with just body weight training, I, I, and body weight training, sometimes you know, kind of people look at it like it's this again inferior way of working out. But I tell you what, you look at uh, some of the the most developed body weight trainer type people, gymnasts, for example, or yeah, you some know, of these guys doing calisthenics all the time, like with amazing physiques. Incredible. I mean, it's in the tension that you create with an exercise, your body doesn't really know what you're using necessarily. Now, of course, the strength that you gain tends to be specific to the movement, but body weight exercises have so much carryover to the real world. And you can make, for example, you can make a push up very, very challenging with tension, tempo, yeah. using one arm, elevating your feet. Um, there's a lot of different ways to make that basic exercise very, very effective, like a bench press. Well, have you ever heard some of these like calisthenic guys make and like make a really good argument on why you should focus there first? Yeah. And they make a really good point in case. I mean, if you can't control your own body and body weight in space, um, why would you add load to that? And so it, you know, that makes a lot of sense for someone who's getting into lifting. If you haven't done these body weight exercises and perfected them with good form and been able to do them with at least several reps before you start to pile on a, a barbell. No, I mean, when you look at overall safety and longevity it's a pretty good case you know it is yeah. it, well it really gets you connected to your body and in the awareness of it and that's why too like a lot of strength coaches promote uh especially with kids to to really dive into like things like gymnastics things like um you know where uh, they're basically like doing all these like tumbles and flips and push-ups and you know things where they're they have to figure out their uh, place and space with their body. Yeah, parkour. Yeah, yeah resist parkour, that's what I was looking for. And then another one is resistance bands, which, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, when I started in, in the fitness space, nobody uses nobody used resistance bands. I, there was actually at home uh, machine called a, a, a solo flex. You guys remember that? Solo is it flex. Bowflex. No, Bowflex too, like but then there was a solo flex before yeah, that. Solo flex. So uh, it's not that's not what the same thing. I always thought it was the same. It's no, not the same so, company, different company. Uh, I think they're different companies. So the solo flex had like these like resistance like, kind of band looking things. Yeah, yeah. And the Bowflex used like resistance. Uh, they look like bows that that they would use. Oh, that was a difference. Yeah, so the flexes. So I remember the solo flex. They looked like these, like uh, like kind of infinity sign, but it was a rubber. Yeah, and, and were, you put on different ones. Yeah, and yeah. Use resistance. I don't know why I thought I always thought that was Bowflex who did that. So they were different companies. I, huh? They might be the same company. I mean, they sound similar in the names, so it makes sense that it would go from Soloflex to both. I mean, that makes me really curious if like one yeah. of them totally piggybacked off the other one, right? Yeah. Who was first and then who came up so with So you'd it? add those almost like plates. Yes. Yeah, yeah you would. I and, and I remember like with resistance bands for a long time, as trainers and you know strength coaches, we, we thought of them as like, oh, that's what you do in aerobics classes or that's not nearly as good as, as free weights. And then- Something changed. The Soviet studies from their their, their weightlifters really started to get 
researched and uh, American weightlifters started to adopt resistance bands as part of their training. And then American powerlifters started to use uh, resistance bands. And what, what's that one uh, powerlifting school, Justin, that Westside Barbell? Yeah. yeah. So Westside Barbell started to really make that a popular Well, they were the thing. first ones to really yeah. make it popular with, with like uh, the strength All community, the unconventional right? tools yeah. with chains, and, and they added a lot of uh, different ways of progressive load. Yeah, and they were crushing. Yeah. They were crushing records. Like, they were just dominant. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, you saw hardcore strength athletes use resistance bands. And I think there's no better way to crush uh, a myth that a piece of equipment's ineffective than having strength athletes break, you know, world records using that particular piece of, you know, uh, tool or whatever. Yeah. So all of a sudden you started seeing resistance bands. And then I remember there was one uh, particular club that I helped grand open. And what they would do is they would grand open. So how big box gyms typically work is you'll have a location and you'll do what's called a pre-sale and you'll have a binder with pictures of what the gym's going to look like. You sell your memberships, whatever. And then typically they'll open it in phases. So they'll open up like the cardio area and then that's it, right? And then they'll open the basketball court and the free weight area. And people could start working out right away. So I had trainers that were ready to go. Clients had bought packages to train with them. But the only thing that was open was cardio. And they were like, what do we do? We don't have any weights. We have no machines. And we went with resistance bands. And I remember a lot of trainers were kind of like, oh, this is going to suck. And you know, how am I going to do this? I remember having meetings with them like, look, you got to get creative. Show your clients value. Anyway, the the trainers were blown away by the results that their clients were getting from using resistance bands to the point where when we opened up the whole gym, they still used it as part of their training protocol. The cool thing about resistance bands is they allow, the problem with body weight exercises is you're working with gravity. So you have to get real creative and move your body in space. Mm -hmm. Resistance bands yeah. are like, uh, it's like if you have a pair of resistance bands, it's almost like you have access to almost every cable machine yeah. right. ever invented. Yeah. I can put it it's very in, similar in a doorway. I can put it low in the yeah, middle. Especially high. Have, I mean, the ones that we sell, right? They have that little cool. I think that was like one of the most brilliant yeah. inventions it I ever seen. Wedges right there in the crack of the door. I didn't so see that until until the one we got. I didn't know how long that's existed or not. But I remember when we first partnered up with Rubber Bandits and got those. That was one of the, the uh, other than the, I know the bands are some of the best, lifetime warranty and all that good stuff. But like, I mean, bands are bands in my opinion, as mm -hmm. far as like that. But what I thought was fascinating was the, the door hinge thing. Cause it's like, that was the only challenge with the band is like, oh, if I wanted to anchor something down, it's like, if you didn't have something with a hook, it was like, oh shit, I yeah, can't what do, do I tie it to? Yeah. Yeah. But with a door wedge, it's amazing. Oh yeah. With that, you basically have a free motion machine mm -hmm. where you can make right. any, any cable exercise you can imagine you can now, now do with a band. So if you have body weight and you have resistance bands, you can mimic or do almost any exercise with those things. Which takes up like barely any space. Any No, no space. Yeah. takes no space. In fact, uh, resistance bands, I mean, you could, you could carry them in a small duffel bag, no problem, pull right. them out, and you have a door in your set. Then you throw in tension and isometrics, which is still today, and I, I will make this prediction right now, in the next five or 10 years, it's going to be all the rage. Mm -hmm. Because if you read the studies on isometric training, which by the way, decades there's decades of studies on isometric training and athletic performance muscle building how it augments traditional resistance training tons and tons of studies is it because it's boring you think like why why do you think it's not i think a lot of people well, don't know is, how, how do you do how do you uh you know portray that in videos it's just that's what i mean just, it's just it's just not <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's just, face, it's just really. not sexy right yeah. i think that's the reason why is because people look at it and be like oh this isn't this isn't cool and mm -hmm. it's just as like you said you show a video of it and it's just someone sitting still yeah <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah but I mean, it's so effective yeah and it, i think in the next five or ten years people it's going to become the this advanced training tool that all these people are going to start using but isometrics builds tremendous muscle strength, very minimal damage on the body. Um, it allows you to really maximize your muscle contraction. It's this incredible tool. And the cool thing about isometrics is you can add it to almost any routine yeah. with, a, with a small amount of additional recovery required. You yeah. can't say this about a lot of training modalities. Like if I oh, add- There's but, minimal damage yes. uh, from this type of training modality. And that's what's so awesome about it is you can go from like a kid to like, you know, somebody that has like limitations physically, like anybody, uh, you know, an elderly uh, population. Um, so it's just so applicable all the way across the board. Well, very easy to regress and progress it. Like you could take anybody, like somebody who is an advanced Stage that has all kinds of conditions can train isometrically yes. and without risk. That's what's great about totally. it. Totally. And then the last thing that I'd say is probably super valuable for home workouts are suspension trainers. Now, to be fair, 
suspension trainers became popular relatively recently, but the but rings, which is what they copied, right? If you look yeah. at like a, like gymnastics rings, the have been around for right decades there. and decades and decades. And what you know, really smart marketers did is they adopted that for use in group classes, and you know, this is what you can. Justin, use at home. was that the was that the root of it? Is that where, where so the inspiration rings, came from? Ropes and uh, ladders. I would I would argue that this was something you saw a lot in gymnasiums back in like twenties, yes, and, you know, thirties, and this was very common for even in physical education. Like that, that was the focus was climbing, and um, it, it was it was something that you know it was like a lost art. Uh, that we found, but they actually started to kind of use a lot of those uh, types of angles and techniques and, and placing your body against gravity. And so they found that, you know, with these straps, it's like you could emulate a lot of those things a lot easier. You know, it's one of those things that I remember being a trainer being so when it came out on the scene when like TRX, right, yes. exploded. I was so mad. Like, aren't you like so mad that you, it's such a simple concept. Totally. Yeah. But, and so valuable that it's like, it's such it's like a duh moment By the for way, me the, when that went The reason why it became popular. popular at first was because it was backed by um, the very powerful marketing machines of the group uh, classes. Like they have the, what were the names of them? Like Les Mills and all Les this. Mills. Yeah, Les Mills. Yes. And, they, and they, they did such a good job marketing it. And then the reason why it continued to be popular is the truth is suspension trainers can be a very effective tool for traditional strength training. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most effective tools you can use for traditional strength training if you know how to use it properly. And there's some exercises on um, on suspension trainers that I actually prefer over oh, other yeah. pieces of equipment. Oh yeah, you know and joint stability and you know I use my, I use my suspension trainer every workout one way or another. Whether it's the main focus of a workout or if it's to prime something or it's just a warm up real quick, like or it's a trigger type of a session. Like it ha it has so many uses for it that I find myself using it daily. Yeah, and so the like open chain and closed chain yeah. movements, right? Like so I always get these like mixed in terms of like which one is which but like so you know this this is one of the best ways to in, enhance that and, and intensify that process with these to really like so it is closed is closed chain closed chain is moving your body away from the the the, the anchor point the or whatever anchor point, and then right. open, open would be so like a, a moving a, towards it yeah so like a bench press would be open chain because i'm moving the bar away from me closed chain would be a push-up i'm moving okay. my body yeah, away from uh, my hands and both of them require a little bit of a different skill, different stimulus. So you now here's the other issue that people, and we kind of you know talked about this a little bit, but one of the challenges people have with at-home workouts is the lack of variety. I tell you what, body weight, resistance bands, suspension trainers, tension or isometrics, and the combination of all of them. This is the beauty is that you can, I can do uh, isometric tension type training with bands, body weight, and suspension trainers. I could do traditional resistance training with all of those things. I could do combinations of all of them and I can manipulate the tempo. I could do unilateral training with them. I could change the angles. Now what you see is this tremendous amount of variety with minimal equipment. And again, the challenge is yeah. most people who have some experience working out in gyms have no idea about the all the exercises and variety that you could do with those, you know, those, well, things, to, those tools. Yeah, to that point, that's why you can't really blame them for thinking it's not that effective to do this because it, it does require that that knowledge of of how to utilize your angles properly, how to like apply some of these methods of manipulating tempo, of adding isometrics. So you know, it it does require a bit of that knowledge. Okay, so I'm an average listener. I want to build some muscle. I want to lose mm -hmm. some body fat. Um, I do have access to a gym if I want to. Sell me on why I would do this. Well, here's the number one, and this is what's 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 cool about what you're about to, what you're talking about, Adam. So when the lockdown, I'll tell a story, right? So when the when the lockdowns first happened, I was getting a lot of DMs from people that were like, "What do I do? Like, I, I know push ups, squats, lunges, and pull ups, but like, what else, what else do I do?" And again, it's because people just don't. They they a lot of people who work out have no idea on how to construct a routine with suspension trainers, bands, body weight you know, isometrics and that kind of stuff. And so a lot of these people, um, they, they signed up for like maps anywhere or map suspension, or I would just tell them through DMs some ideas that they could come up with. These were some people who had a little bit more experience. And then I would explain this. I'd say, look, let me ask you a question. How long have you been working out? Okay. You know, three years, four years, five years. How many times have you done a training cycle utilizing these techniques? Yeah. Never. Meaning you a cycle, meaning you've done this for weeks consistently, not just yeah. one workout or right. one exercise. Right. And so then I said, okay, do you what happens to your body when you find a new exercise that's effective that you've never really done before and then you get good at it? And all of them are like, oh my God, I get incredible gains. 
We cannot understate the power of novelty when it comes to getting the body to adapt. In fact, this is something I've always played with. If I find a new exercise for a body part that I suck at, mm -hmm. I get good at that exercise. So I'll get better gains with that exercise than I will with the ones that I've been doing for so long that I'm now kind of adapted to. This is what drew me into unconventional methods. I mean, it is it is that novelty. It's that new stimulus that your body, it, it needs to learn how to do it properly. And so it, it has to respond. And so it just sort of like, uh, you know, it, it, it clicks something new that your body has to fight and, it, and it, you get a whole new um, sort of uh, 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 response from that. Yeah, and I think, it's not just uh, the novelty, but how novel it is. So, like, there's there's novelty in uh, doing a um, barbell bench press, right, flat bench press, and then going to a dumbbell flat bench press. Right. There, there's there's novelty in that. That's Definitely. different. There's it's a little bit of a different stimulation. Like you've got the independence with the dumbbells. Like body's going to be shocked a little bit. It's going to respond. It's going to adapt. You're going to see a great response from that. But then there's something to be said about something as novel as like this suspension trainer where there's all this instability and you're you doing your feet this cool, elevated and you're right. Yeah. It's like so different and unique that there's a lot of things are, are, are on your body that are having to adapt and learn and figure this out. And I just you get so much more return the more novel something is. Like learning something that is already kind of similar to something else, you get a little bit of benefit still because it's changed mm -hmm. and it's different, but switching it from something completely different. That's like, I mean, the way I, I recommend programs to people is I always ask them like, okay, what are you currently doing right now? And the first recommendation I give them is always a program that we have that I think is the most different yeah. than that, right? Like if someone's telling me they're training a specific way, I, I know I could give them almost any MAPS program and they'll see some good results, but I know that if I can give them something that is way different, or that's way opposite or unique compared to what they're currently doing, they're going to see the most change. Well, yeah, and it also unlocks and, and uncovers weaknesses that you didn't realize. Uh, and that's what I love about the suspension trainer too, is just because that added bit of instability, it really highlights uh, where your body's not properly stabilizing and responding. And so, you know, to, to go through that, it really helps then to carry you back into uh, your regular training routine. Well, to that point, I think that, that what highlights another tremendous value from it is just the, the mobility focus. My sister, when, um, you know, we had MAP suspension. How long? We've had MAP suspension for a couple of years now, right, Doug? We've had it for a few years. And when the lockdown lockdowns happened, uh, my sister asked me, she's like, hey, I kind of want to do something different. Like, you know, which one of the programs should I follow? I said, have you done MAP suspension yet? She's like, no, I, I haven't done that one. So she got that one. I was getting, I got more message from her on that program. I remember. She was constantly telling yeah, me, she's like, that. oh my God, That's I great. feel, yeah, be, like she's like, I've never been able to get down that low on like a bench press. And she goes, the way my shoulders and my chest and stuff is feeling right now, it's so crazy. Well, back to Justin's point, your body gets so good at compensating uh, that you you can't even notice half the time. Like this happened to me years ago. Like I love deadlifting, right? Everybody knows that. It's my favorite, one of my favorite exercises. I always deadlifted with both legs, all right? Conventional. I would do some sumo here and there, but usually conventional. And then I remember doing a one-legged deadlift with dumbbells. And it was, I mean, it was embarrassing to me how yeah. little weight I could use and how unstable I felt. And also the discrepancy between right and left. Now, if you watch me deadlift with the barbell, even if you're a trained eye, you probably wouldn't notice. I didn't notice that I had a right to left imbalance, but I definitely noticed when I did this one-legged uh, deadlift. For sure. So, so then I decided, let me get strong on this one-legged deadlift, and then I'll go back to my traditional deadlift and see what happens. So what happened was it forced me to work on the the weak areas, right? I wasn't comp I wasn't able to compensate like I could before because it's a new exercise, something that I'm not used to. When I went back to my traditional deadlift, I was stronger. I felt more stable. I was stronger. And then it became very glaringly obvious that there were compensations that were happening that I, I wasn't aware of. You know, it's funny. As an, as an experienced lifter, uh, you get that now and that you're probably attracted to things like that. When you're early on in your career, even some trainers, when you're, when you're early on in your lifting career, uh, that normally discourages you. Of course. And you yeah. move away from it because you're like, oh, I suck at this or this is hard. You're like, F that. I'm going to go back to doing. And the irony in that is that if you're if you're seeking more results, change, body composition, like you want to improve, yeah. there's nothing better than doing something you really suck at. Lean or that into you, the weakness. Yes. Yeah, well, look, here's the deal. Um, again, we've all experienced those, those newbie gains. You start an exercise and you see your, your, your strength go up 10 pounds every single week, right? But now you've been doing it for a long time. Like let's say your barbell squat, you've been squatting for four years and you're at 300 pounds, right? Adding five or 10 pounds to it, that's gonna be really hard. And that's gonna be a, quite an accomplishment at that point. 
But then let's say you go and you try a pistol squat, just a one-legged balance squat. And you're like, oh my God, this is so hard. You might not even be able to do one because you lack the mobility. But even if you can do one, you find yourself doing like six and you're like, that's it. I can't do more than six. My form totally breaks down. The, the wonderful thing about this is you start to tap into those newbie gains again because that first time you did six, try it again five days later or four days later. Now you could do 10. You added four reps to an exercise and you're advanced. You've been working out for years and that'll keep happening for like a few months until you start to plateau again. Then you take those new strength gains that you got in a one-legged exercise, move back to your you know barbell squat and then watch how you feel. All of a sudden, you're more stable, you feel stronger. And you know this even goes to the mobility uh, conversation we're having. I remember there was a, 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 a power. I can remember specifically there was a power lifter, a female power lifter, who was so distraught over the fact that she didn't have access to a gym when all the lockdowns happened. And I told her, and we'd go back and forth. And she's been following us for a long time. And I said, focus on mobility. She's like, but I'm going to lose strength in my deadlift and my bench temporarily. And, my and I said, <laughs> I said you will because yeah. the strength is quite specific. You can't practice those lifts. I said, but practice mobility, and here's what I predict will happen. You'll, when you get back to the barbell, you'll be a little weaker than mm -hmm. you were before, but then not only will you get back up to where you were before very quickly, you'll surpass. Watch that ramp up real and fast. And it did. Within a month and a half, she broke all her previous records because she did that special emphasis on mobility. And the beauty of working out at home with mobility is, for most people, myself included, if anything is neglected, it's like people who don't like work out their calves very often, right? The number one most neglected part of, of working out, especially for younger lifters who want to build muscle and burn body fat, mobility. They just don't place a special emphasis on mobility unless they hurt. Well, I was gonna say it's hard when you're when you're young, you you don't get a lot of the, the obvious signs. I mean, I'm I'm guilty of this. Like it's really easy for me to remember to focus on my mobility because I mean I just shared on the on the podcast what maybe less than a week ago. I went and did an overhead press and I hadn't done a barbell overhead press in maybe a month or two or whatever. I go to do the movement and realize, oh my God, how yeah. much I let my back, my lats are tight, my shoulders on fire. Like I feel myself arching. I can feel that discrimination. I mean, as you get older, you feel that stuff and that breakdown easier where you, there's a little more resilience when you're when you're really young and hard to well, see I that stuff. Well, I just find it so ironic that uh, we're so focused on getting stronger all the time, uh, but we're not reinforcing that. And, you know, mobility, it's its the perfect partner. And if you just keep those together the whole time, you can keep perpetually moving forward. It's just like inevitably you get stronger. You're putting way more stress and, and the ability for you to like do damage like increases. Yeah. Bro, uh, it's, substantially. Your, it's your, it's not sexy. It's just like your isometrics. It's like, it's not sexy. That's why mm -hmm. I, no, no, nobody's like, nobody's uh, bragging about their, how much yeah, more. You're not PRing mobility. How, yeah. How mobile yeah. they are. And, and you are doing that when it comes with strength gains. So we, tend to especially when you're a young lifter and you're not getting the nagging pains that mm -hmm. are, are reminding you that you should probably do it but yeah i wish i wish i had the, the knowledge and the experience obviously uh, that i have today when i first started as a trainer because i think that if you understand this and you just learn to incorporate it it doesn't need to be this massive focus you can just go through a, a cycle where you decide okay for the next three to four months i'm going to train this way and then you can return to your other stuff or you can take bits and pieces of what we're talking about and build it into your normal yeah. routine and it won't and, or you can wait till you're in your 40s and you're fucking broken you can't get lift your shoulder or your arms above uh, your behind your ears and you can't squat all the way down past 90 degrees and then now it's like this daunting task. Well, that's because there's a misconception that mobility is primarily to avoid pain and injury, which is true, but there's another side to it, which is, and this, we're talking about proper mobility, right? Connecting to ranges of motion, owning large ranges of motion, mobility, you know, preventing injury and helping you, you know, alleviate pain. That's a great value. Let's put that aside. Mobility makes you stronger and speeds up the gains that you can get. A lot of people don't realize this. You know, it reminds me of this. I read this article a long time ago about with Bruce Lee in it. Bruce Lee was one of my favorite uh, movie stars and martial artists. And he talked about the, uh, the benefit of having a strong and stable wrist for punching power. And the author, the person who was interviewing him said, yeah, but the wrist really doesn't generate power. Like the power is coming from your hips and how you're throwing your shoulder and your arm. And he goes, yeah, imagine hitting someone with a broomstick, but half of the broomstick is made out of like this flexible rubber. Yeah. Like I hit you with that. Or it's and it just cracked a little bit. Yeah, you can't it's, tell. It's not generating tons of power. He goes, a strong, stable wrist allows that power transfer. 
good mobility allows your body to to reach its full potential, allows you to generate more force to activate more muscle fibers, essentially build more muscle. So forget about the pain and stuff. And by the way, when you wait till you hurt to work on mobility, it's like- It's too late. Yeah, it's like waiting until you're severely dehydrated, dehydrated to drink water. Like, okay, yeah, you should drink water, but we've, we shouldn't have got here in the first place. No. Mobility does that. It speeds up that progress. And working at home, because now we don't have all this equipment to distract us, it's a great opportunity to make this a focus, like for a whole workout. It's it's also a great time to do a lot of like uh, balance stuff, stuff that is going to challenge your stability because totally. you don't have a ton of weight. So like, instead of me looking at my gym at home and going like, oh, I only have fifty pound dumbbells. Well, okay, I could do a you know one legged you know deadlift with fifty pound dumbbells and roast the shit out of myself mm -hmm. the same way I would feel pulling four five hundred pounds. So this is a great opportunity when you go through a cycle like this to start to focus on a lot of stability stuff and it doesn't take that much weight. Yeah, I uh, I really felt this firsthand. When we first started the show about seven years ago, uh, Justin would rave about like overhead carries, which is really a combination of balance and tension. And you talk about walking with kettlebells overhead or a barbell or one arm dumbbell holds and, and walking, which requires some balance and stability. And I remember he would rave about it and of course, you know, I'm, I'm like everybody else, the, the proof is in the person and Justin's got this great overhead press. And so I said, let me give this a, sh a shot and see what happens. And, uh, I was blown away by the carryover in my, in the strength that I had with my overhead press, just from working on that balance and stability in the top portion, right? Just improving my muscles ability to, to fire uh, stab and stabilize. So it's not just moving, but it's holding steady yeah. and strong. Now, what does that allow, right? Think about this. When you're pressing a weight, there's a lot of energy that goes into moving the weight in the direction you want. But the more your muscles have to prevent the barbell from moving all over the place or the dumbbells from moving all over the place or your body yeah. from moving all over the place. There's tons of leak of uh, performance. You're, you're, it, it's, no, it's no different than a car with a lot of horsepower that just can't connect to the ground. You, you, you hit the gas and the, exactly. and the tires spin in the dirt. doesn't matter if you have 600 horsepower. Your car is sitting still. It's Can it stick and can you transfer that power? Balance allows that. Can you can't talk it? about balance and stability too, though, without talking about core strength and training your abdominal because oh, yeah. how often do you see that as the breakdown? I remember I teach a client like to balance on one leg and they're focused on their foot, on their ground. Man, their shins would be on fire and things like that. But Meanwhile, they're, their torso and everything right. else they're, is They're so the unstable in the core area that it's making this really basic movement or exercise so challenging because they're thinking of the, the, the foot and the ground and trying to stabilize there. But really, it's, not, it's because they're not rigid in their core and they have no stability here of why that is so challenging yeah. when they do that. Uh, okay, this is why if you are a, a seasoned lifter, and you're trying to lift uh, a heavy squat or even an overhead press or especially a deadlift, and let's say your max is uh, on your overhead press, 200 pounds. You're like, man, I'm stuck at 200 pounds. Then you put on a weight belt. All of a sudden, you can lift 15 pounds more weight, right? Did you just make your shoulders stronger? No. What you did is you created artificial core stability. How the hell are you able to lift more weight all of a sudden? Well, now your body can generate more force to moving the weight and because it's not worried about your core stability being yeah. compromised. It all transfers through the core and core stability is oftentimes the weak link in people's training programs. And core exercises, some of the best core exercises require zero. In nothing. fact, nothing, almost nothing. I mean, the only piece of equipment I would ever really use for core training would be a resistance band or a cable for like mm -hmm. chops. Yeah. Other than that, like, are you guys familiar with any ab or core machine that's even clo as close to as good as body weight stuff? No, no. no it's all it especially all when done properly because doing a a crunch. Uh, the right way where you are like rolling your spine up oh, yeah. is extremely difficult. Most people are doing it wrong. Most people are firing their hip flexors, using momentum, and they're not even really training the core and the abdominal region that well. And so if you learn to actually roll the spine up slow and controlled, you can make yeah. just your body weight extremely difficult. Yeah. And just to the balance and, and control and stability kind of side of things, I used to do a test with a lot of my clients just to see if they even had the ability to communicate with their entire body from fingertips to toes. 
And uh, if you guys are familiar with the hollow body position, yeah. you use that a lot in uh, gymnastics. And really, you're just lifting your legs, maybe a foot off the ground. You're pointing your toes out, and you're getting as rigid as possible all the way, basically making a boat out of your body. Yeah. And your arms are over your head, and they're just up over your head like this and locked out. So it's just the ability to be able to contract like all of your muscles at the same time. You have that ability. You have to train that ability, though. So that way, if you get in a, a situation where I'm thrown off, I'm left the right i'm twisting i can bring myself back uh to complete balance and control you know where i saw some of the uh, i saw a huge carryover from learning to do those to my deadlift yeah i thought it was really interesting because it's not like something that, that it looks like you it don't would, think so right? yeah like you don't yeah. you don't look at it and go like oh i'm trying to get better at my deadlift i'm going to do these hollow body uh uh you know ab isometric exercise and you're like that doesn't make sense why is that working that way but when you do a deadlift it's so important that you've got everything connected from your fingertips all the way down to your toe and everything in the middle right and being able to communicate that all at one time and keep it very stiff and rigid Oh, man, makes a huge difference yeah, there, on being able to pull more weight. There were three exercises I used to like to mess with my trainers on. So these were the trainers, like, they're, like, fit and they're ripped, and, you know, they'd talk about how strong they are or whatever, and I'd have them try a hollow body. I'd have them try a long lever physio ball crunch, which most uh, people— Most people do those wrong. Most people do not do physio ball crunches right. I don't care how strong your core is. If you do a proper with full extension, full contraction, hips up, long lever, you're not doing very many repetitions. Uh, and and most, you don't people, need to. most people can't even do a few properly. And then the other one was an active plank. Uh, plank exercises became so popular in the gyms. It used to annoy the hell out of me because yeah. trainers would have their, and it was a great way for them to waste time. All right, it was. everybody. It, was, it became a trendy <laughs> thing in my gym for like oh. trainers in their last 10 minutes of yes. their workouts with their clients. All right, let's see how long you can hold it. Yeah. I, I remember watching it. I'm yeah. like, man, that is a hip flexor yeah. exercise. It's like back is arched <laughs> and the hip flexors are contracted. So then I'd say, let's try an active plank or let's try this kind of posterior pelvic tilt plank. And my trainer's like shaking and like, oh my God, I can't believe I can't even do this. Yeah. But then you do it and the carryover to other exercises, usually it was the overhead press, uh, squat and deadlift that people would see yeah. a lot of carryover. And then here's something else I want to kind of communicate about the advantage. And this is why I prefer to work out not in gyms. These are the reasons right here, right? Uh, number one, I get to listen to whatever music I want to. <laughs> yeah. I can play it loud. I can play even if it's Yanni. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't <laughs> matter. Now I know you go to a gym and you put your headphones on and all that stuff and you can still do that kind of, but there's still people around you and whatever. When you blast it in the air and you listen to whatever you want, it's freaking awesome. The other thing is I can train whenever I want. Whenever I want. And I don't have to count the time it takes to get to the gym change, work out, get back into the car, go home, especially when you have kids and all that stuff. Nobody's trying to work in, right? Like yes. When, when I'm just like, I'm here working on my thing only exclusively. I don't need somebody competing for my spot. It's here. your well, equipment. Yeah. Well, it avoids the most annoying part about being a trainer, uh, or at least what I thought was one of the most annoying things about being a trainer is training a client during prime time. And I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever wrote a routine and was able to <laughs> no, run no, never. that exact routine. No, not a prime time. And that, that I mean, way. it's it's. I tell you, it made me a good trainer, right? You have to be able to know what the desired outcome of that that routine is that you wrote down, and then know multiple pivots for each one. If there's people on all the equipment or using the stuff that you need to use, so. But it's also annoying, you know. That's a, that, and the, one of the things I love, obviously, about training myself. Yeah, I could do a different exercise. I know I'm capable of thinking of something else. But hey, when I write a routine for myself, like I want to do the things that I write down. And so you avoid Dude, that. It's so funny. It's probably, there's a good and bad to it. As a trainer, it's a, it's a great way to make you better at thinking on the fly and coming up with, you know, different varieties of exercises and substituting exercise. Cause you're in prime time in a gym, especially yeah. a big box gym. And you're going to have your client do an exercise or machine nine out of 10 times. It's two or three times during the workout. You're going to go to use that piece of equipment. Someone else is on it. It's not, it's being occupied that space that I was going to use. My tail's on that one, bro. Yeah. So you'd have to use, you'd have to be creative. But like you said, Adam, this is when it would really irritate the shit out of me. For my clients, I, and again, I'm a better trainer for my clients than I am for myself. When it was my turn to work out, and I've been thinking all day about doing my yeah, yeah. incline press and my dumbbell flies over here, and I'm going to do the pec deck, and then I'm going to do these cable rows. And then I go to do my workout, and there's some numb nuts on the freaking machine sweating all over it. Or even worse, I go to jump in and the person using it has no idea of gym etiquette. Oh, I have, you know, don't worry, I have three more sets. <laughs> I'm the manager of the gym. <laughs> yeah, I want to say something like that, right? But I don't. Super annoying. You work out at home, it, do it, it's yours. 
No, nobody's going to jump in. It's your Ready, piece of set, equipment. Go. Yeah, you do your thing. And that's now, it. when you guys are when you guys are coaching uh, clients, and and let's say they've been doing something more traditional, they've run a maps, anabolic performance, aesthetic, and you recognize some things, some instability, some mobile uh, mobility issues. Maybe they're complaining about joint pain a little bit, and they haven't focused in this direction. How long do you typically like to have them focus in this area? Would you would you be extended period of time where they're doing this for like a year, or are you doing this for a few months, or you just interrupt it for a week? Like, what does it look like when it, you when you minimum a month, it. I would yeah, say minimum, minimum. Yeah, minimum. It depends four weeks. on the severity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would have to go through that and see like what kind of level they are in terms of like you know what are the imbalances that we're really dealing with. What kind of pain as a result of this dysfunction are we going to have to work through? And uh, uh, yeah, I would I would structure it along that. But it, yeah, less than less than a month, I think is is probably. Oh, I think at least three to four months. So do I. Yeah, and exactly. I said a, I said a minimum of a month because what it looks like is the first week they're learning the exercises. The second week. They're starting to get used to the balance and stability. The third week, they're starting to really be able to add intensity. Yeah. By the fourth week, we're doing the workouts. So at that point, like you said, Adam, I like at least another month or two to really push and, and progress. Yeah, so they can see the real benefits. Yes, but the, but less than a month is, in my opinion, is like dumb. It's a like, disservice. Yeah, we're just throwing novelty at someone, and they have no, they're not really adapting to it and getting. The, well, the especially results. if they never really experienced that, because that first month is literally them, their body's just getting acclimated and adapting yep. to the the new stimulus, and so it's you're not even really getting to reap the major benefits from it. So I I like to do like the typically most of the programs I wrote were in these like three month type of blocks yeah. and so very similar to how we write mass programs and so this would be like a block focus for me i would literally go okay for three months these these are our objectives we're going to strengthen your core we're going to work on balance stability mobility just body weight type movements and so i'm going to do that over the course of the next three months these are the things i want you to be paying attention mm -hmm. to you know we're not thinking about how high can our bench press get i'm not talking about you shredding 15 more pounds the focus here on all these these attributes that we're trying to achieve to improve your body and what future lifting is going to look like the, to your point Sal is that don't worry about mm -hmm. if my bench press goes down a little bit right now temporarily because you're going to reap the benefits of that when we get back yeah totally it's uh it, it's definitely a process and I would usually have to 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 convince clients for the first two or three weeks but then once they started to feel and see what it was like that was it and it was always once right I have to convince my client once after that they do whatever I said because I've proven to them hey this totally works but I mean, this is why I'd say uh, the average MAPS program is at least three months long. We don't really create these super short programs because it is a process and you don't really reap the benefits until you get past that. Your body's learning the balance, the ability. Oh, now I can start to push away. Think about the first time you did you know, a, a bench press. The first time you did a bench press, I mean, you're not even yeah. really pushing with your max strength because you're balancing the bar and you're shaking. It takes about a month before you can really push you the bar. you got to give your body a chance to adapt. Absolutely. So anyway, here's what we're going to do because we're talking a lot about at-home workouts. We've given a lot of great tips. And I think if you follow all this and you have a good idea of what exercise you want to incorporate and you modify your cable movements with bands, you throw in body weight stuff, you do tension, you get a, a pair of suspension trainers, which are very inexpensive, and do exercises and construct a great workout program. You'll get great results. But a lot of people like things written out for them. They don't want to go through the process of programming. So what we did is we put together a at-home uh, workout routine bundle. We're calling it the ultimate at-home workout uh, holiday bundle, essentially, which includes MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Prime, where you're going to get some of the mobility stuff, MAPS Suspension for the suspension trainer workouts, and the No BS six-pack formula, which is basically a very, very effective core Intensive training program. Intensive core training. That's right. Now, what we're doing with all of this is we put this together, and because it's the holidays, we've this is probably, I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Doug can correct me, this is probably the biggest discount we've ever done on a bundle like it's this one. It's substantial. It's 70% off. Right, so you get all of them for all of the programs we just said for uh, $99.99. So it's a 70% savings, and so it's all mapped out for you, no pun intended. So if you're interested in getting this program, head over to mapsdecember.com. And is the discount automatically applied, Doug, or do they need a coupon code? Cool, so mapsdecember.com. There you go, sign up. It's all planned out for you. Look, if you like our information, if you like the stuff we talk about, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our free guides. We have guides on everything from fat loss to muscle building, how to teach you how to squat better, overhead press better. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal, and Adam is at mindpumpadam.